Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. Today I'll be talking with Leah Verstegen. Uh, Ms. Verstegen is a physical therapist who works at Alpine Physical Therapy here in Missoula, Montana. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Well, Leah, today I thought what we would discuss is, is a very common problem that I'm, I'm sure that you see as much as orthopedic surgeons do, and that's the problem of patellofemoral disease or patellofemoral pain. It goes by numerous different uh, sort of names. I think we used to call this chondromalacia patella. But I think really it's much more accurate to really talk about it as a, as a range of problems that really means that, that pain is originating there in the front of the knee and we think it has something to do with the kneecap and the, the tendons that attach to the kneecap. Mm -hmm. So I was hoping that we could talk a little bit about how you as a physical therapist treat that disease process because orthopedic surgeons quite frankly don't like operating on that <laughs> sure. unless they absolutely have to. Yeah. So we tend to rely on the physical therapist to a great deal to try to treat this with physical therapy, with strengthening, and really try to get those patients to a point to where they don't need surgery. So first of all, describe the problem for us. What, what do you think is going on with that, with that disease process? Well, it's a, it's a malalignment of the patella on the femur. So the patella is a floating bone and it's connected via tendons, ligaments, um, to the tibia below and to the femur above. Um, as that bone is a floating bone, it's pretty easy for it to get out of, out of place. And when it drifts out of place, the bottom uh, aspect of the patella will rub on the bone below it and cause inflammation. The cartilage breaks down. Uh, a lot of people explain it as just kind of an achy pain under their knee when they're walking up and down stairs is a pretty common time that it'll, it'll flare up. Um, see it a lot in, in runners, especially trail runners here in the mountains when they're going up and downhill. So it's that wear and tear on the bottom of the kneecap as it rubs against the adjacent bone. You know, and I think I should point out to, to patients watching this is that's why we used to call it chondromalacia patella. The whole term chondromalacia means that the, the, the cartilage, the articular cartilage on the undersurface of the, ne of the kneecap begins to, I would say, degenerate or wear out. But what, what you see first is just it becomes sort of uh, uh, roughened and begins to lose that nice shiny surface. And that's what we term chondromalacia. Um, I think the term chondromalacia really means breakdown of the, of the cartilage more than anything else. Yeah, yeah. And of course the term patella means kneecap. So when we talk about the patella, we're really talking about the kneecap bone or the, that floating bone on the front of the knee that, that you talked about. Okay. So when, when you um, evaluate these patients as a physical therapist, let's say that um, this person has been having problems off and on for several, several months. They've seen their physician. The physician as I said, uh, doesn't really want to consider an operation and wants to try and address this with physical therapy. So what are you going to do when you first see that patient? How do you evaluate this patient? You know, the most important thing for me is to watch that patient move. So most people who are complaining of this type of pain, they don't get it when they're, they're just sitting still. They'll get it when they stand up after sitting for a while, or as I mentioned before, walking up and down stairs, hills with movement. So person comes in, it, you know, we, t we talk for a little bit about their symptoms, and then I watch them walk. It's the number one thing that I look at right off the bat, just walking back and forth. I'll have them walk fast, um, and then we'll do some basic functional tests, a little squat, uh, standing on one leg, look at their balance, and I just watch what, what's happening at that knee joint. I also look at the joint above and the joint below, and that's where uh, we're, we're beginning to understand a little bit more about what's happening with uh, patellofemoral pain is by looking at both the ankle joint and its stability and the hip joint and seeing what happens to the knee in between. So functional testing is what I look at first. Uh, from there, I'll go through and look at strength. So I want to see how their quad muscle is firing. The quad muscle is the main muscle that inserts onto the top of the kneecap or the patella and helps control what happens there. So I look at um, the, the um, relative strength of the outer or lateral part of the quad muscle versus the medial part of the quad muscle. Um, calf strength and again hip strength so that we can screen the hip and ankle. And uh, lastly, I'll look at the flexibility, not just the movement of the kneecap, which is a very important component, um, whether it's moving medial, lateral, inferior, or superior, so up or down, in and out, um, but also the flexibility of your hamstrings, 
of your quad muscles, your hip flexors, uh, and, and the ankle stability. Now, now you mentioned the hip and the ankle, and I'm, I'm sort of intrigued in terms of, of what you're looking at there. Are you looking primarily for range of motion, for example, in the hip? Uh, you mentioned ankle stability. Can you describe to me how those two joints actually affect the knee or the patellofemoral joint? And, and how they may lead to either imbalances or, or problems in that joint that cause pain. Sure, yeah, this has been a, an area of a lot of research recently in, in physical therapy and in, in orthopedic, um, in the orthopedic world where we've, been, we've benefited a lot from recent technology. There's now MRIs that we can do with movement and a lot of research down at the University of Southern California has focused on patellofemoral pain specifically and what happens at the hip and ankle that can contribute to that pain. So they have found that uh, the hip particularly, not just flexibility but more so stability, the hip is a ball and socket joint so it can rotate in and out and it's the femur bone that's doing the rotation. And with these, these movement MRIs they've seen that in cases of patellofemoral pain, the femur is actually rotating or moving underneath the kneecap when people go into a functional squat or standing on one leg. They'll see excessive rotation of the femur below the patella as opposed to pooling of the patella on the femur. So traditionally we always thought that the, the patella, a weak quad and a tight IT band that controls the kneecap was pulling it to the outside and causing the um, malalignment. Uh, recently, the past three or four years with this new technology, we've seen that it's actually the femur rotating under the patella in most cases that causes the rubbing um, on the bottom aspect of the kneecap. So we look at hip strength, particularly of the rotators. Um, gluteus medius, gluteus maximus being the two prime bigger muscles and then the balance with your hip flexors and um, IT band, TFL, some of the medial rotators. So that's where the importance of the hip comes from. Now, now question, that, that's sure. intriguing to me because, it, you know, I think as an orthopedist we always tend to think of, of the hip joint as being constrained by the bony anatomy. You know, it's going to move where it's going to move based on the fact that it is a very constrained joint with a very deep socket. What you're saying, though, is that you can affect that. It's not just the bony anatomy so that when you flex the hip, it sort of picks an arc, and it's going to go in that arc based on, on how the hip joint is anatomically. What I think I hear you saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that you can adjust that by looking and balancing the muscles around the hip joint that actually guide that motion so that you can in some ways overcome or perhaps correct some of that bony uh, alignment that, that tends to, to make that arc that, that people are going through when they flex their hip sort of rigid. Mm -hmm. is, is that accurate? Yeah, you're correct. The bony anatomy does definitely dictate what happens at the hip and there are people who are genetically predisposed to having a little bit of a little bit more rotation of the, the femur and the hip socket one direction versus the other. But it's, the, it's very small movement so we're not looking at a, a huge motion. It's a matter of a, an inch or so. Um, when you watch somebody, for example, just stand on one leg, they should be able to keep that femur pretty, pretty stable, pretty still, where you don't see it shaking or, or moving back and forth. And in a lot of cases with patellofemoral pain, you'll ask them to stand on their affected side, and you'll just see a, a very subtle but con constant motion of the femur just moving back and forth. And that's, the, that's what we're trying to correct. We're trying to build the stability of the, the rotators around the ball and socket joint to help make it as stable as possible and in proper alignment. Well, that, that's very interesting. And, and what about the ankle? Now, how does that affect the way the knee uh, works? Well, as we all know, foot hits the ground first. So that's the stability from the ground up, similar to the hip stabilizing the femur from below, the foot and ankle has to stabilize, uh, or the hip from above, the, the, the ankle has to stabilize the tibia from below. So if you have somebody who is an excessive pronator, for example, their arch drops a lot, their tibia is going to tend to rotate to the inside, drop to the inside, uh, and that can affect the knee joint. So the tibia comes to the inside via the attachment of the ligaments. It's also going to pull the femur with it. Um, you'll see what's called a genuvalgum stance or knock knees um, with an excessive pronation at the foot and ankle. And again, that pulls the femur underneath 
the kneecap. And although the kneecap does drift with it, it doesn't always go with it 100%. So it might stay to the outside just a little bit. And then again, you get the rubbing of the kneecap on the bone below it. So that's, that's one example. That's primarily what we look at is, is the pronation at the foot and ankle and if they can keep a stable arch and a, an ankle joint that isn't shifting back and forth as they stand and walk. So once you've made that assessment and, and you've tried to determine what, are, what, what components are actually causing some of these problems, you know, and you've evaluated the hip, you've evaluated the ankle, and you've evaluated the knee, how are you going to begin to work then to correct some of those problems? Uh, the number one thing to explain to a patient is that it doesn't happen overnight. Because it is a muscle imbalance, it's going to take strength and flexibility training. Strength training takes at least six weeks, more typically eight weeks, before you see a true functional or physiological uh, strengthening of the muscle fibers. So I prepare the patient and let them know that you know they're not going to see any changes right away and we start with training the weakest muscles. So if I find that the quad muscle that controls the knee joint isn't firing properly, we start by trying to um, get the person to fire the right part of the quad muscle. If I find glute max is weak, similarly, we'll, we'll start with just basic strength training. I don't have them do it in a standing position right off the bat because that will aggravate their symptoms. We wanna try to minimize the pain at the knee joint while improving strength as much as possible. Um, so we do what's called open chain strengthening. They're often laying down minimal stress on the joint itself. And as, once they get strong there, then we can bring them into a more upright position and start doing um, single leg balance, small squats, up and down, short steps progressing to um, a typical step height and focusing on the balance of the, the joint. So what I, what I look for when, once they get to that standing position is that their knee points straight ahead over about the second toe. So when their knee bends, it should stay in that plane, moving straight over the second toe. It shouldn't drop to the inside or to the outside. Um, I get pretty, pretty picky, <laughs> pretty specific with the alignment of their leg with movement. Um, and from there, depending on what they want to do, if they're a runner or a basketball player, we need to make sure they can maintain that with jumping, with dynamic movement, and, and go, from, go from there. Well, a couple of things. I, you know, I think there's, there's two things that patients always wonder about in terms of physical therapists. And, mm -hmm. and one is, is the use of modalities, because I think a lot of physical therapists are, or a lot of patients are used to coming in with a physical therapist and expecting that physical therapist to do something to them. It sounds like this approach is primarily things you're teaching the patient, working with them to really um, understand what exercises they need to do, what they're trying to achieve, and then pretty much it's, it's up to the patient to, to begin to do that effectively. Do you see any, any role for modalities, what we would call modalities, such as ultrasound, electrical stimulation, anything that you would do to the patient to help them achieve some gains? Uh, yeah, it, you know, it depends on where specifically their pain is. That's the difficult thing with patellofemoral pain because it's something happening below the kneecap. Um, with that, that friction, sometimes it's hard for a modality to be effective at that point. If they're also experiencing some pain on the outer aspect of the knee, some IT band tightness, that's a, an area where some ultrasound can help with alleviating tendon uh, tendinopathy. So if the iliotibial band, that IT band is irritated, or the patellar tendon, which can also become irritated. Uh, we can use ultrasound or uh, phonophoresis, which is an ultrasound with a little anti-inflammatory um, in, the, in the gel to help calm down inflammation. Uh, ice is always very beneficial. I definitely recommend ice to my patients, especially after they've been active. If they're trying to continue their sport while treating patellofemoral problems, then I, I always recommend doing 10, 15 minutes of ice, which is also a modality. Um, those are probably the main ones that I would work on with patients. Like I said, it, it depends on what their symptoms are. If it's localized just to pain under the kneecap when they're going up and down stairs, sometimes modalities just don't, don't work as well in those situations. 
And, and you know, you, you, since you mentioned the ankle and how important it is for the heel strike and the, and the way that patients actually put their foot on the ground, do you see any benefit of adjusting shoe wear or maybe adding an orthotic to the mix to try and, and affect some of that pronation that you're, that you're worried about in terms of the foot? Yep, definitely. Um, I, I do a pretty thorough evaluation of the foot and ankle if I see that they are pronating when they're walking. If it's um, a flexible pronation, then I would recommend a f a, an orthotic that has some flexibility to it, especially if they're a runner or an athlete. They're, your foot naturally, the arch has to drop a little bit. You have to pronate. It's part of shock absorption when you're running, when you're jumping. So we want the arch and the ankle to be supported, but supported in being able to maintain some of its flexibility. So in the case of an over pronating flexible foot, I'll recommend an orthotic that can can work with them. Um, I often start with just an over-the-counter orthotic just so they can try it out before they go and um, spend you know several hundred dollars on a custom orthotic but oftentimes they do have to go that route if a majority of the um, malalignment is coming from the foot and ankle. You know and I think the other thing we ought to probably mention is is your philosophy about knee braces because I think a lot of people with patellofemoral braces there are tons of braces on the market down from just the little straps that you wear uh, sort of right under the kneecap to, to pretty elaborate braces that are designed to try to control how the kneecap actually moves through the groove. Do you find those at all useful? I do find them useful in helping manage symptoms. So I mentioned earlier a lot of people will try to continue with their sport while treating this because often it is just that nagging constant ache. It's not something that's gonna put them on, on, the, on the bench or make them have to rest for long periods of time. So I'll, I'll recommend the brace to help decrease the symptoms while they're getting stronger so they can continue walking, um, playing sports. But it's not something that I recommend for long-term wear. So I would rather see somebody use the brace for the first six to eight weeks while they're working on their strength training and then gradually wean from that brace as they can actively stabilize the kneecap and the knee joint and again, hip and ankle. So it's a, it's a benefit in symptom management, but not long-term, this is what I'm gonna rely on to stabilize the knee. You know, I think a lot of patients are always worried about the logistics of, of what to expect when they see a physical therapist for patellofemoral knee problems. Mm -hmm. And I think they're worried about a couple of things. One is, you know, how long is this gonna take? And, and sure. what am I really getting, getting into in terms of uh, what I'm going to be doing with that physical therapist, how many times a week, that sort of stuff. Can you give us some idea about how you sort of structure a program for a patient? You know, and, and a couple of things. One is, is how many times a week or, or do you expect them to come into the physical therapy office and actually engage with a physical therapist? And two, how long before this is over for them? You know, how long until you've sort of reached a plateau and, and you're saying, you know, I've taught you everything you, you need to know. Your symptoms are controlled, and you just need to do this on your own, and I'm going to release you from care. The magic question, yes. <laughs> the looking glass. Um, well, I typically like to see people twice a week for the first two to three weeks at least. Um, most of that is, one, to get them on an exercise program that they can either do at home or in their gym, um, and then to make sure they're doing the exercises correctly. And, and inevitably, we listen to everything your, the therapist tells you, and then you go home and you look at that handout of home exercises and say, what in the heck am I supposed to do here? So I wanna make sure that they are, one, doing the exercises, that it's, it's something feasible for them, and that they're doing them correctly. So the twice a week for the first two to three weeks, that's four to six visits right off the bat to get them on a really nice, strong home exercise program. Depending on the individual, if they are, have pretty good body awareness and good self-motivation, um, I'll go down to once, once a week or sometimes once every other week for that first six to eight weeks where they're building as much strength as possible. If it's somebody that you know, needs, would rather have the watchful eye and the guidance, then we can, we can continue twice a week and I can go through their exercises with them each time. Uh, after that eight week mark, six to eight week mark, I will retest their strength, make sure that they have um, adequate open chain strength, get them on a, a progression, a pretty solid progression um, to more functional exercises, and then I'll probably see them again two or three times in a row 
and then I'll, I'll let them go for a few weeks and, um, and they can come back in as needed after that. Uh, typical length of time, I would say probably 12 weeks is, um, is a pretty typical patellofemoral management timeline. So three months, three to three and a half months. Hey, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things that um, when I look back 20 years, I think things have changed a lot. And it used to be that knee rehab really was uh, uh, a, a woman's purse or a bag hung over your ankle uh, with a couple of cans of soup uh, thrown into the bag. And, and a lot of physicians felt like that that, that was the treatment um, for strengthening the quad for these patellofemoral problems. And, and what you've just described is a, uh, obviously a far more complex not only understanding of the disease process, but also a far more complex and, and I would say accurate understanding of what needs to be done to actually work on this and get it, get it to the point to where you can reduce the symptoms. So I, I really think, I, th I thank you for coming in and explaining this for patients. Is there anything that you think that we haven't covered during this discussion that you would like patients to know about patellofemoral disease or the, or the patellofemoral pain problem in general or about what they're going to be in for in terms of a physical therapy program to treat the disease process? You know, I think the most important thing is just understanding that you don't have to have constant knee pain. You know, a lot of people, especially as you get into your, your 40s or 50s, you, you think, oh, my knees are wearing down. It's just part of what happens. And yes, we do have more aches and pains as we age, but it's something that can be minimized, not to say completely eliminated. Most of the time when people come in with patellofemoral pain, they've already worn down some of the cartilage, like you mentioned, that nice shiny surface is no longer there. I'm not going to be able to recreate that for them. We're not going to give them a 100% healthy knee, but we can definitely minimize their pain and improve their function so that they can continue with as active and healthy of a lifestyle as they want to. Um, you know, it, it, walking up and down stairs, I mentioned earlier, one of the main things that I hear when people come in with patellofemoral pain, oh, I just look at a set of staircase, a staircase and it just makes me cringe. Well, you don't have to cringe when you see the steps. Um, we can definitely minimize your pain and, and improve your function. That being said, it does take some diligence and some time. You have to continue with your exercises and make sure that you get strong and don't just throw in the towel when you don't feel better in three weeks. Um, but there, there is definite room for improvement. Well, I think that's good news because, as you know, this is a very common problem. I think, I think the vast majority of us are going to have a bout of patellofemoral pain at some point in our, sure. our lives. Yeah. So this is a common problem. And the fact that it's got you know, a very reasonable solution for improvement today is, is probably a good thing. So thanks for explaining that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.